previously on Retro Hack Shack. The fan is on and it seems pretty stable. Look at that, the IBM personal computer. Wow, really cool. And look what I got out of there. Some really nasty oil or grease or something was in there causing it to stick. This thing is working, 100% working. That's awesome. I do want to go back though and make another disc for the setup and take care of the setup options. Okay, I'm ready to try to run the setup program for the IBM uh, 5170. And what I've done here is I've connected a uh, 1.4 meg uh, floppy drive up through a floppy drive cable back to the same controller. And then I've hooked up a power adapter so that it can get power. Um, the reason I did that was because I'm going to try running a program called G setup, which should write the... Um, uh, the CMOS or the BIO stuff that the 5170 needs correctly. Um, and it seems to be a little bit easier to use than running the original disc. It's certainly easier to make. I could make a 360K disc off a of drive image using that PC I was using before, and hopefully this would read it. But I feel a little bit better. Lots of people have said that the G setup program works great. So, so I've got the G setup program loaded on this 720K disc. And it is a 720K disk, and it's formatted as 720K, and the image is 720K. Pretty important if you want this to work correctly. But this is a 1.44 meg drive that will read this 720K disk correctly. And I guess there's some sort of, uh, in the BIOS, there's some sort of uh, firmware in there. When this boots up, it'll actually let it see a 720K disk. So that makes this program work. So let's put power this up and see if it'll run this G setup disk. Okay, and her new date. Um, I'm gonna leave the date alone. It's set for 1-03-1980. I don't believe this is Y2K compliant, so um, yeah, I'm just gonna leave it as 1980. We can all pretend it's 1980. Five seconds left in the game. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! CBS News, Washington State's volcano erupts in a major explosion and nearby communities are prepared for lava flows which have so far failed to materialize. Rubik's Cube, over three billion combinations, but just one solution. The new chapter in the continuing Star Wars saga is now in our galaxy. New time, don't really care. And now here is the, or in the DOS diskette. So I think there's a memory test I can run. Yeah, mem size. I just want to make sure that the memory is reporting correctly. Wow. Okay, it found the problem, it found the uh, following memory at power up, 512K. Okay, well, yeah, I knew that. I just didn't know how it was going to report out, whether it was going to be in bytes or in kilobytes. So it looks like it's in kilobytes. Um, so now we can run, I think it's just G setup. Your CMOS RAM has lost power. <laughs> I don't wonder why it's doing this. This is so weird. Check and or replace batteries and power supply or call manufacturer. Resetting CMOS bytes to defaults. Press any key to continue. Oh, the whole thing is going to be like this. Look at that. Wow. Okay. Okay, well, I was trying to figure out why the display wasn't working in G setup, and I looked up the switch settings, and there is a switch. Uh, it's right down there, and it's by the power connector, and it only goes one way or the other. One way it's for MDA graphics, and the other way is for CGA graphics. And I guess when you're running EGA, it doesn't matter. You can have it in either position. So I'm going to turn that switch, or set that switch the other way, and see if that fixes the G setup problem. Um, also, it said that uh, if you did not have that switch set the right way, that you could get that 401 CRT error. So now that that's set the other way, let's boot up and see what happens. Oh, only one beep. Oh, no errors at all. I don't know if you can see that. This just, the screen is dim when there's not much on the screen, but there's no errors at all now that came up. I was getting like a couple different errors, and now there's nothing. So, very interesting. It is remembering the date and time now, so that's good. 
So let's run G-Setup and see if it displays things correctly. I can already tell G-Setup is weird again, but I don't really care at this point. It looks like it remembered the settings. So um, I don't know, I could run diagnostics or something. I'm not gonna bother. It looks like everything's weird. If you know why G-Setup is doing this weird wraparound where it looks like it's starting from over here or something and wrapping around, let me know in the comments below. Okay, the next thing I wanna test is running an XT to IDE board so that I can simulate a hard drive using a compact, compact flash card. Um, and unfortunately, with the 5170, there's a problem in the BIOS that won't let the XT to IDE device run. So the only way around this that I know of is to update the BIOS or change the BIOS out. And so uh, here's the BIOS chips here. They're in U47 and U27, I believe. And they even say right on the chip, I know it's going to be hard to read because it's upside down. They say right on the chip U47 and U27. And so you need two of these in order to um, uh, have the BIOS work. And so what I did was I found the award BIOS. You can find that out on minus zero degrees. And I created two chips, one for U27 and one for U47. So let's pop these old IBM chips out and see if this award BIOS will work. Whoops, good thing I checked that. Got a bent pin. That would have been a bad day. Okay, let's see if the new BIOS will work. Oh, that looks good. Ward BIOS software. Testing system memory. Looks good. Interrupts. Uh, protected mode. Expansion memory, zero found. One of the reasons I wanted to try this award BIOS, in addition to supporting the XT to IDE card, was that it comes with an escape sequence that allows you to program the BIOS settings without having to use a setup disk like the one that came from IBM or G Setup. So I really wanted to try this feature out and I'll test that in just a minute. And we've booted up into MS-DOS 5 installation. So looks like everything's working okay so far. Let's see if we can get the XT to IDE interface up and running so we can attach a hard drive from a CF card and put this thing through its paces. Kind of curious to see what's inside this little battery compartment here. Fire explosion and severe burn hazard. Do not recharge, disassemble, heat above 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Solder directly to the cell, incinerate, or expose cell to water. I guess that's because of the lithium. Huh. There. So that's all it is. I already cut the wires off, as you can see, but they were going out there. And then it looks like they put some epoxy or something in there to hold the wires. And, yeah, just lithium batteries. They look kind of like uh, AA batteries or something. Man, those are really in there. I'm not going to get those out. But anyway, if you've ever wondered what's inside the battery packs that are inside these old IBM PCs, there you go. Okay, so I've got my uh, XT IDE um, board in with the uh, CF card that I typically use in my 5150. I've got the award BIOS running and this card installed. Let's see how easy it is to bring this thing up. So this, sh if it works, it'll be booting off of that card like a hard drive. Oh, look, and there it is. Well, the video mode is really weird, though. Oh, but there it goes. Booting C. Um, this loaded external disk driver stuff is some leftover stuff from one of the very first videos I did where I added a third and a fourth floppy drive uh, to a, well, just a third. I could have added a fourth to the 5150. I added uh, two external uh, floppy drives. But uh, otherwise, this looks like it's running, but the video mode is really weird. It's really small. It's like it's using the smallest video mode possible for this. But we know it runs in eight, essentially 80 column mode because when it booted up, the BIOS was displaying in 80 columns mode. So maybe there's something goofy going on with the graphics controller I have or something. I'm gonna get an I, uh, EGA card and hook that up and see if that's working. So I've got this Vega or VEGA card from Video 7. Um, so I'm pretty sure this will, uh, do EGA graphics and, uh, from 1985, the BIOS here, it's called video seven and they just taped it on, or maybe someone replaced this at some point, 
But it's also got some dip switches up here and a toggle switch. So yeah, hopefully I, whenever I use this last, I left it in EGA mode, but if not, then I may have to play around with the settings. It is a cool looking card though. I love like the colors. This is one of my favorite logos of any IC is this chips logo. I just think it's so cool. Anyway, uh, let's see if this works. Now it says equipment configuration error. And it also says that, um, it also says that if I, if I move the, um, the video, um, slider switch over there to the other mode from CGA to MDA. So it's saying press F1 to continue or control alt escape for setup. So let's just hit F1 and see what we get. Oh, and we get the same kind of display. That's interesting. Maybe I need to change this in the award BIOS. Control alt escape for setup. Okay. So here's the award set up here. It retained most of the settings. Video is color 40. So let's change that to EGA and see what we get. F10 records changes. So this is starting to look like a, a normal BIOS now. F10 to save and exit. Press F5 to confirm update. Let's see what we get. Okay. It didn't complain. Oh, there we go. There it is. That's what it should look like. So we did have to go in the BIOS and change that card in order to get this to work. I wonder if I put the old card back in and change that to 80 column mode or something, if it would show up normally. Uh, but anyway, this looks like it's working. Um, let's do check it. Okay, and here we go. There's no math code processor in here. So the math code processor is, there's, it says no coprocessor. So the math speed is gonna be relatively low. The video speed is relatively high, I would say, and it did recognize it as an EGA video adapter. And then over here, it recognized 286 CPU at six megahertz. And it's saying that we're running about as fast as a Model 30. So I guess these were the popular models at the time, but we're, yeah, here's PCXT down here and we're running quite a bit faster than that. So that's cool. Now this is the mode that I think we were in, is this graphics grid mode 04H, because everything was really packed in there. So far everything looks good. Here's an 80 column mode, black and white. And that's it. So it wouldn't go to the higher resolution. So maybe this is actually only compatible with CGA. Okay, and here's our colors. So this does look like EGA colors because there's more than four. We've got the brown, which is looking good there. And again, brown looks good. I always look at the browns because that's the hardest color to, uh, to emulate. And that's it. So we don't go to that higher resolution. Interesting. Now I went back and flipped some of those dip switches on the card and I was finally able to get a mode that recognized as full EGA. So when I went back, I got this screen, which is the final color screen, meaning that EGA is now working fine on this card. So everything now appears to be working in this 5170. So it's finally time to give this thing a bath. I'm gonna disassemble everything, get all the cobwebs out, and clean it up. And I'm also going to clean up the EGA monitor that I found with it. And then we can look at the entire system complete, clean, and restored. All right, let's just take a little break because it's been a while since we've had a Penny Cam. Penny is now a little over 18 months old and she's calming down quite a bit. She's kind of entering adulthood uh, for a dog. And But one of the things that she does that's still super cute is she always brings a toy when she's eating. She brings a toy over to her bowl and puts it in her bowl while she's eating. Now, we don't know why she does this. Uh, she started it maybe six months ago or so, but she brings a toy, sometimes two or three toys to the point that she can't even reach her food and she has to dig in with her uh, nose in order to get her food out of her bowl. But it is super cute and Penny's doing great. So look forward to future appearances by Penny on the channel. So the first thing to do was to disassemble this PC. Now, I'm sure you've seen as I've been going through these videos here that this PC is really dirty on the inside and the outside. Lots of cobwebs, lots of leaves and particles have gotten into this thing. So it really needs to be cleaned well. And that starts with removing the power supply. Now, when I took this screw out of the bottom of the power supply, it came out pretty rusty. 
So I'm betting there's some corrosion or rust underneath the power supply as well. The power supply itself is really shiny uh, where it wasn't exposed to any of the elements, but where it was exposed, you can clearly see that it's had some corrosion and there's some rust underneath the power supply too. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the motherboard is missing some of the standoffs, but really it was a simple process of just removing two screws that hold the motherboard into place. And then it was pretty easy just to slide it straight out the side of the case. And here's a closer look of all the leaves and crud that have gotten in this thing as it no doubt sat outside or in a shed somewhere. And you can see that rust down here underneath the power supply. We're gonna have to do something about that. Now I also removed the power and hard drive activity LED indicators as, as well as the lock here. And that just slid out the side. Then I carefully removed the speaker to get that out of the way so I could really give this a good cleaning. And by good cleaning, I am not messing around. So the first thing I did was just use some uh, compressed air to blow out all the leaves and bit large particles. And then it was time to bring out the big guns. I got out the hose and just went to town on this case to get all those little pieces of crud out of here. Don't worry, I'll dry this really thoroughly to make sure there's no, no rust or corrosion builds up, but this thing just needed a really good power washing. And remember the case, remember that big stain on the top? Just look what happens when I start washing this off with the hose. You can see that dirt just coming right off the top. And even the motherboard can't escape this computer car wash. That's right, I'm just gonna go ahead and spray this whole motherboard off. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, oh, you shouldn't put that underwater, you're gonna short circuit something. Well, not if I'm careful. If you make sure not to use too much pressure and you make sure there's no components that are loose on the motherboard, and of course you make sure you don't plug it in while it's still wet, then you can actually use water to clean motherboards off fairly effectively. And this is where a compressor comes in handy. You can really use the air on the compressor to get underneath all the components and push that water off the edges onto the ground. So I spent about 10 minutes making sure that I got under every single IC and that I thoroughly cleaned out every single socket on this board, making sure there was no water left. And by the time I was done, the board was clearly dry and there was no more water squirting out from under the ICs anymore. Well, I left the motherboard to sit out overnight to make sure it was dry and it was time to turn my attention to the rust on this bolt and on the case itself. And so the first thing I tried was putting some vinegar all along the back of the case to see if that would neutralize and get rid of some of this rust. And you can see when I came back and wiped off the vinegar, it did get rid of some of the rust, but it still left quite a bit. And I didn't want to have to necessarily go through this process 20 times before I could get this completely cleaned up. So I decided to turn to something I've been wanting to try for a while, and that is a product called Evaporust. Now this is the gel version, but you can get it as a liquid so you can soak things in it. And it is a rust remover. It's supposed to be non-toxic or uh, at least not as toxic as some other products. Um, and this gel version should sit nicely in the back of this case. You just leave it sit for a while and then come back and rub it off. So at first I just decided to dab some of this on with my finger because the rust was really localized to one particular area of the back of the case. And then I realized that the instructions actually said not to use, not to get it on your hands. So I guess it isn't completely non-toxic. It could burn uh, your skin if you leave it on there for too long. So after a couple hours, I came back and just wiped away the uh, evapor rust, and it really did a great job. I didn't have to do anything. It either got rid of or neutralized the rust. You can see there's some black residue left, uh, but that rust where I had put it is completely gone. I missed a little bit there on the back of the case, but I can come back and clean that up. If you really wanted to finish cleaning this up, you could just get a little bit of steel wool and rub that down and it would be as good as new. Well, after the screw soaked in the vinegar for a little bit, look at the difference. It also took the zinc off of the screw. So it got rid of the rust, but it also got rid of the zinc. So be careful if you're gonna be soaking these screws in vinegar. 
Now it was time to turn my attention to the case. There was still a little bit of residue where the monitor had sat on top of this case for so many years. And by using a little Windex, I was able to get most of that stain out. However, there was still a lot of black marks around the case that even with all my tricks, I couldn't get out completely. So unfortunately, the only thing to do with this case is really going to be to paint it. And I didn't have time and I didn't think you wanted to wait several more weeks for this video to come out. So we're just going to go ahead and move on with the restoration, knowing that that will be a project for some time in the future. Okay, so now it's time to turn our attention to this monitor. This is the monitor that came with this PC. I assume this is the one that I got at eWaste. And just look at how dirty this thing is. It's got crud in every corner and the top is uh, really bad as well. It just looks like it's been sitting perhaps in like some sort of a shop environment, maybe a mechanical shop. And it just has years of built up gunk all around the monitor look at the feet on the bottom of the monitor. I mean, they are completely disintegrated to the point that the screws are actually sticking out beyond where the rubber once was. So these absolutely have to be replaced. So I took the cover off and brought it into the kitchen for its own bath. And waiting for me were my trusty toothbrush and green scouring pad that do so well for me. And uh, now it's time to give the case of the monitor a little bath here. And all that was needed for this monitor, believe it or not, was just a little soap and warm water and elbow grease. You can see how that dirt is coming right off, almost with no trouble at all. Just needed a little attention to bring it back to its brilliance that it had back when it was in service in the 80s. And of course, I made sure to get every nook and cranny with that little toothbrush. It seems like overkill maybe, but I'll tell you, when you get that whole grill done and you get all of the dirt out of there, it really shines like it's brand new. Now, when I was cleaning up the um, power indicator and hard drive activity indicator panel, I noticed something interesting. The original adhesive paper was still on the back of this sticker that should have been um, stuck down when it was assembled at the factory. Unfortunately, my camera stopped working and I wasn't able to get the moment that I peeled off that adhesive paper, but here it is anyway in slow motion for those of you who like this sort of thing. Oh yeah. So once the monitor case was dry, I turned my attention to replacing these feet. Now I found these 3D printed uh, replacement feet on eBay and I thought I would go ahead and try them out. But one thing I had to do first was clean out some of the uh, areas where the uh, print hadn't fallen off on its own. And uh, that was kind of a pain, but I just used a screwdriver to make sure that um, all of the spaces uh, didn't have any strands of plastic fibers remaining in them. And it was just a matter of reinserting the screws that I took out from the old feet and putting them through these new plastic parts. I think these are gonna work out really, really well. For the front of the case, I had to use a broom to get all of this dust out of the corners here. And then it was just a matter of wiping this down really good with some Windex, paying special attention to the dials, and of course, the shiny IBM logo. Well, it was finally time for reassembly. Now I dug around in my parts bin and I found some of these plastic standoffs that'll be perfect to support the motherboard on this far edge over here. Then it was just time to slide the motherboard back in carefully and make sure that those standoffs got stuck in the uh, slots like they were supposed to. Then in went the power supply, being careful to make sure that the little tabs went under the metal strips there in the back. And for the little battery pack I made, I went ahead and used some of this uh, spongy adhesive tape, which I really don't like to use hardly at all. But in this case, the battery doesn't weigh hardly anything, and it's actually the perfect thing to keep this attached to the back of the case. Um, and I can still open up the case and change out those batteries if I ever need to in the future. Then it was time to reattach the speaker where it goes, kind of on the side of the case in this slot here. And then finally reattach the power and hard drive indicator panel uh, to the front of the case. 
it's easier to position this ribbon cable, this nice, shiny, new, clean ribbon cable, uh, first before you put the floppy drive in to make sure you uh, can attach it. It's a lot easier to do it that way since there's not a lot of room in the back there uh, between the back of the floppy drive and the power supply. Now I can just slide that floppy in and reattach that L bracket to the front of the case to hold it in place. And to make this look a little bit better, I reattach this blanking plate to the front as well. And yes, it doesn't match the other plastic exactly, but maybe I can do some RetroBrite on this little panel in the future to get it to match up a little better. And after I put the cards back in their places, all that was left was to slide the case on and get the monitor back on top and the keyboard out so we can take a look at what this thing finally looks like after all this cleaning. Just as a reminder, here is what the computer looked like and the monitor looked like before the cleaning began. And here's what the finished product looks like. Again, I'll probably have to paint the case, uh, but I know now that the inside is free of cobwebs, leaves, and other rodent uh, droppings. And now the monitor looks like it's really brand new. It cleaned up really, really well. Okay, well here it is, the uh, almost fully restored, except for that case, 5170. It sure does look a lot better though, so the only thing now to do is to turn it on, see if it works. And I guess this will be also a test for all those doubters who are uh, questioning my uh, hosing off the motherboard. Will I fry something? Let's take a look. First I'm going to turn on the monitor, let that warm up for just a second. Appears to be still working, so that's a good sign. And let's go ahead and turn on the PC. Fingers crossed. Ah, look at that. The award BIOS is working. Everything seems to be working just fine. No naysaying of my spraying of boards. So because I disconnected the battery, we're going to have to go ahead and enter the uh, date and setup information again. I'm going to leave this set on 1980, but it is currently 9.20 p.m. as I'm recording this. So I think that would be military time, right? So 21 colon 20 colon 00. Ah, there we go. Just get one. 1.2 meg. And that looks good. F10 to record changes. F5 to confirm. Oh, I checked the floppy drive. There we go. It's booting up the hard drive, booting C. We are all set to go. Now, the real cool thing will be to see if we can play Bard's Tale on the actual monitor. Let's see what that looks like. Seems to be loading. Come hear the tale of Shara Bray. Chakra Bray? Shkara Bray? I don't know how to say that. Well, this all seems to be working. My only question is, is there supposed to be sound that goes along with this? Because if there is, I'm not hearing it. Yeah, so I'm not hearing any sound. Let's load up something that I know has some sound and see how that's working. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, that had me scared for a minute. Now, of course, this is a CGA game. So, uh, yeah, you get the nice purple and cyan hues here. But, uh, yeah, let's just make sure this is working. Do I want to use a joystick? No, not right now. I'll be a kitten. And uh, press any key to start. And here we go. Let's jump, I forget. Is it just up? Oh yeah, it's just up. There we go. Oops. Hey, look, I got in the little uh, thing here. Oh, get by the broom already? Oh, come on. There we go. Got one. Got him. Ta-da! All right, well, 
I think that's enough of this, but it looks like everything is working great and now it looks great too. Well, I've got to say, I'm super happy with how this came out. You never know when you get something from e-waste whether you're going to be able to restore it fully or not. In this case, uh, no pun intended, the case needs some more work and I kind of recognized that as I was cleaning it. It's like, nope, this is, this is not going to clean up the way things normally do. So a paint job is the best uh, uh, thing to do in that certain, in that circumstance. This is my first 5170 that I've had and been able to restore and go through. And I've learned a ton. So many quirks with this particular machine. I mean, it was, uh, the first AT, uh, computer to, uh, hit the market. So there was a lot of things probably that they didn't know or were just starting to come into fruition at that point in history. So things like the BIOS, for example, uh, having a configurable configurable settings that you can go in and access and change on the fly uh, was still a brand new thing. And having some of those weird uh, issues with the uh, resistor, the startup resistor, and the memory issues where if you didn't have the right memory, you didn't get any display on the EGA monitor. Luckily, I didn't run into that because my memory was good, but there's all sorts of things that could throw you off with this machine. But the real surprise of everything was that this thing was even working. I still can't believe with all the crud and stuff that was inside and how this system must have been treated over the past 20 years or so. I am totally impressed that basically I didn't have to do any motherboard uh, trace repair. The, the tantalums didn't blow yet. We'll see uh, on this particular board. Uh, it, it really is impressive that this machine, after all it's been through, is actually working and can get to a point where it looks pretty good, I think, at this point, at least to my eye. So I hope you enjoyed this series. If you did, please give this a like. If you want to see more, make sure you subscribe and hit that bell for follow-up episodes like this. That actually, I started doing that recently. I hadn't done it before, but now for certain channels, I'm hitting that bell so I get notified. And of course, you can become a patron. Uh, I would really appreciate your support and it does help the channel. Uh, it helps, keeps it going and I can fund things uh, like these LED lights behind me that came from my patrons. So thank you so much for that. So I really encourage that as well. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, see you later. Patrons receive ad-free and early access to content after the episode commentary and of course, your name in the credits. If you liked that episode, here's a few more you might enjoy, and I thank you for your support. End of line.